Good morning. My name is Matt Seeley, and on behalf of the entire Organic Produce Summit, we want to thank you very, very much for coming here. It's great to see your, I hopefully, our smiling faces behind all of these masks that are out here. Uh, we've got a great day planned for you uh, following last night. Hopefully, everybody had a nice night at the reception last night. We've got a great day of educational uh, sessions as well as our sold out trade show floor. Uh, I want to begin by asking you guys a question. Quick show of hands. Uh, we're nine months into this year. How many people were familiar or had heard the acronym CEA uh, prior to this year? Not bad, not bad, about 50 percent. I'm going to be in that 50 percent. I kind of heard a little bit about it, unsure of it, but I think if there's one thing that we can all agree on is that over the past nine months, we've learned or seen a lot about this segment of the industry, uh, particularly as it relates to the amount of money that is being pumped into uh, indoor growing and controlled environment agriculture. Uh, although this category makes up less, less than 1% of total produce sales right now, uh, I don't think there's any denying that this is going to be an industry that is going to be worth watching, potentially a game changer for all of us. Uh, at the same time, there's some interesting dynamics associated with this. On one hand, we have, uh, we have some things that are coming out that say, with indoor growing, we don't have to use pesticides. There's no pesticide use. We use a significantly less amount of water and there is potentially a lar lar lower carbon footprint because of the local component of indoor growing. On the other hand, there are large aspects of indoor growing that do not grow in soil. And if we know one thing about organics, that is tenant number one, the product must be grown in soil. So we've got an interesting paradox here. And as we were putting together this, this session and the session behind this, we're gonna learn a little bit more about what the impact of this is on, on organics. So what we're gonna do over the next two hours is we are going to talk first with the producers. We have a lineup here of three gentlemen who represent various facets of the indoor growing community. And then in the second hour, we are gonna follow that up with what the retailers and consumers have to say about indoor growing and its impact on the supply chain. We are very, very fortunate today to have leading the discussion on this, one of the organic industry's uh, most visionary leaders. Uh, you probably know him uh, for having over 40 years of retail experience and he ran a grocery store chain called Whole Foods. You may be a little bit familiar with that. Um, he has told me he doesn't like the long bio, so I'm just gonna turn it over to a, a mentor, an advisor, an investor, Walter Robb. So this is our lineup, and we just got out of jail last night just in time to do this session with you. This so, uh, but any, so seriously, we have three wonderful folks here that are uh, in different parts of the indoor growing community. But let's start out this morning um, with just kind of the question for each of them. I'd like them to uh, introduce themselves as we go. Otherwise, we'll spend all day on bios. Uh, but so a little bit about yourself and what you're doing, but what, how, how do you define CEA, controlled environment agriculture? Because as it turns out, um, it's, it's not one thing. There's a lot of different ways to do CEA and you'll find that out all CEA is not created equal. And um, I mean, really the, the topic of our panel this morning is around uh, reality and hype. What's real, what's hype? And as, Mark, as Matt said, kind of how will this affect the organic industry uh, going forward? At present, it's less than 1%. My own prediction, by 2030, it's, it's, it's close to 10%. But we'll see kind of how that all unfolds. So let's start with you, uh, uh, Paul, if you wouldn't mind, uh, introducing yourself. And then what is CEA and you know, how are you practicing it? All right. Thanks, Walter. Uh, good morning. By the way, what's it feel like to be a fourth generation uh, farmer? I mean, what? <laughs> Tiring. <Is> that, huh? <laughs> Tiring. Okay. Okay. Go ahead, but, uh, please. Thank yeah. you. Good morning, everyone. I'm Paul Mastinardi. I'm CEO and President of Mastinardi Produce. Sunset Speak up Brands. a little louder, Paul, just yeah. so we can all hear you. Yeah. Uh, President of Mastinardi Produce and Sunset Brands. Um, 
So yeah, I'm fourth generation uh, greenhouse grower here in North America. Our family actually started off field farming uh, back in the 20s and then we built the first commercial greenhouses in uh, North America in the early 40s. Um, so we've gone through every aspect of um, adopting from field over into technology over the last 70 years. Um, what is CA to me? Well, CA is everything but traditional open field farming. So it could be just covering mm -hmm. a simple field with plastic to going into mid-tech where you're starting to control other elements like heating and then eventually getting into lighting and um, black box technologies and using different uh, types of lighting. Um, I think I agree with you. I think that that number might even be low by 2030. Uh, you know, I believe that it probably be up to 15 to 20 maybe even by then. Uh, there's a lot of um, money getting into the space right now. A lot of people are very interested in CEA. We know that there's a lot of uh, things going on with climate change and shortages um, of not only just uh, water, but labor and everything like that. And right. if we can get into automation, that's going to change a lot as well, too. Um, and I think that you're going to see more and more crops being grown in CEA um, as we keep on moving forward. That's great. And, 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 do, and do you use the term CEA yourself? We just started using it about two years ago, I'd say. Before that, we always just usually said greenhouse or controlled um, greenhouses, yeah. And you would say everything like from a hoop house to a fully vertical farm would be CEA. So it's a, it's a broad-based term, right? Correct. So, uh, so what should this group take away from CEA? Is it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a number of different ways of growing, right? But just all the fact that they're different than traditional soil outdoor agriculture. Yeah, so you're basically going to control a little bit more than the elements, nature's elements. Um, you're also going to try to capture um, a lot of the water as well that you're using. You're going to use like 1 20th of normal field farming as you get into high tech elements of greenhouse or right. in a black box environment. And so for yourself, for Master Nardi, if you look out five years from now, are you doing 100% indoor? Are you doing indoor and outdoor? Um, so for right now, we're mainly 90%, I'd say, indoor high-tech glass. Uh, we are in berries, and so we do have a couple different technologies in the berry category. Um, mm -hmm. And so items like blueberries or raspberries aren't really in full high-tech greenhouses right now. Do you consider yourself a farmer or a technologist? Uh, future farmer. Future farmer. Okay, great. Awesome. Mark, you're on the other end of the spectrum of CEA. What is CEA for you? So what's really critical when we think about the CEA space, and it's around education, and so when you talk about is this a term we've been using, uh, it's one of the things that we helped form was what's called the CEA Food Safety Coalition. Uh, this is much bigger than just Aero Farms. It's trying to be uh, bring across where we have over 36 members, uh, indoor growers from greenhouse to indoor vertical farms. Uh, but the idea is very much about control. So it's not just the standard hoop or covered plastic. It's about thinking about how do we create a, a more controlled environment. So food safety is one of the critical things we think about uh, when we think about the future of indoor vertical farming and what does CEA potential bring. Uh, but it's important, uh, we are here representing, I'm one of the co-founders of Aero Farms. We've been pioneering and leading the space for indoor vertical farming. So this idea that we're going completely in a controlled space. We're converting warehouses and enabling that local production, bringing the farms to the communities, and being able to be able to grow just in time growing. Uh, it's a way of growing that uses up to over 95% less water, zero pesticides. Uh, it's a way of getting that kind of... Um, really strong economies of scale, productivity up to 390 times greater than we have out in the field. So we're talking over 26 harvests a year when we're talking about baby leafy greens. And so this is an opportunity to really kind of reimagine where you're putting the farms and then making that connection with the community. And then what's been exciting for us is that we're expanding. We've grown over 550 different types of categories. And our work today, our commercial farms are very much focused on the indoor arena. Uh, but just like Paul mentioned, we have a work that's partnering closely with the broader ag community. Uh, we just announced a major partnership we're doing with Cargill growing cacao. So the idea that we can actually grow trees and think about the impact. We announced a major partnership with Hoarder Fruit growing blueberries. So this is something that's very much here today. And the work that we've been doing has been really laying that foundation. So excited to talk more about, uh, about the impact we're having. Right. So your particular, can you all hear me back there? Okay, great. So can you talk a little bit more about your particular version of CEA? Are you, are you a farmer? Are you a technologist? Yeah, at the heart we're farmers because of that connection, but we're also technologists. So the idea that we're, this is this. Did you just answer my question or not? <laughs> the, the answer is yes. Okay. <laughs> so it's yes and, right? It doesn't have to be the either or, right? So this idea that this is, and this is what the consumer is looking for, right? They don't want them to have to make trade-offs, right? And so this is a way of growing, a new way of growing, but it's enabling and leveraging technology. 
But this is not a new playbook. I mean, ag has survived because even the field growers have been able to embrace you know, what is the role of technology. Uh, but what we're trying to do is think about it very differently and thinking about growing it and, and developing the right environment from the plant up. We're optimizing. So what Aero Farms and what makes us quite unique, all of our growing technology is proprietary. And so we've brought in-house all this expertise in terms of growing, the plant scientists, the plant pathologists, but also the engineering, the mechanical engineers, electrical engineers, even the LED, the lighting. We actually have our own proprietary lighting. And so it's this marriage, though, it's this holistic marriage of understanding how to create the perfect environment for the plants and then thinking about the commercial applications. And so today, our commercial farms are focused very much on leafy greens and herbs and thinking about, again, how, how to have the right output, the right economic model. Uh, but we see huge opportunities in the work we're doing today in other categories. We can add value on the seeds and genetics. We can add value on the growing, transplanting. We can add value on post-harvest. So there's a lot of things that our team, today we're an organization over 200 people. We have locations here in the US. We're building out, just in the UAE, in Abu Dhabi, a dedicated R&D facility just for indoor vertical farming. You talk about growing in a very tough environment. Well, this is how we can think about how do we be uh, the right kind of resource for some of the challenges we're facing. That's right. I mean, if, if some of you are aware, a lot of the, uh, the countries in the Middle East have started to worry about food sovereignty and have, um, and have basically appointed ministers who do nothing but think about the future of their food supply. And part of that has been indoor ag has been part of the solution because obviously in the desert, it's very hard to grow uh, crops as we do it over here. So, um, so how, how do you think about the term organic and, and uh, aero farms? Listen, we really uh, celebrate at the end of the day, what is the consumer looking for, right? They're looking for a product that is clean. Uh, mm -hmm. We're thinking about how to be good stewards of the environment. Uh, this is a way of growing with using up to 95% less water. We're talking about our most precious resource right now. Uh, the idea that we can use a fraction of the fertilizer because it's very precise uh, in terms of the type of growing. Uh, the fact that we're using zero pesticides. Uh, this is really important for the consumer. The consumer is also interested in other issues in terms of toxic or heavy metals that are unfortunately you know, some of the issues that you're seeing in the field. So we're very much focused on what is the consumer looking for and how we can uniquely deliver that. That's great. So uh, Chris, uh, Paul, Ant, Paul, I wanted to ask you that same question. Yourself and organic, how do you, uh, how do you see yourself as uh, an organic farmer? Yeah, so we grow both conventional and organic. So in it's green, just, I'm still having trouble. You want to use this? pass that one over. Yeah, so we grow both conventional and organic in the greenhouse. It just depends on the consumer demand and what they're looking for. Um, our belief is that consumers are looking for chemical-free is, is the main thing. When you look at a lot of uh, studies that are out there, in fact, there was a study, I think it was done about five years ago. It's a 100-page study on consumers. Uh, the word soil didn't come up once in an organic survey. You know, they really just talked about chemical use, limited chemical use. They want chemical-free. And so that's what we've been focusing on mainly in the greenhouse is through IPM, integrated pest management, limiting uh, pesticides. Um, but organic, um, you know, I think that term might change over the next 10 years. So you've got a certain percentage uh, between conventional and organic, and you're going to see that you see you're pivoting yourself more to organic in the future? Yeah, I would think that uh, we're growing at a double digit growth on organic um, as a company. And I think as an industry, in the tomato world, uh, conventional is growing a little bit less than that. Yeah. For those of you who have seen the numbers, uh, the organic growth in overall is around double digit for the last five, five years compounded, whereas the conventional growth rates around two or three percent. So those numbers are pretty well documented out there that we're going to see a significant shift over time to the organic demand just continues to rise. So thank you, Paul. Uh, over to you, Phil. Uh, you, you actually are using soil. Yeah, thanks, Walter, and uh, great and to be here. So, yeah, remember to tell guess, them who you are. Because, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, I'm, I'm Phil Carp, and with Shenandoah Growers. Uh, I guess we kind of sit between, you know, Paul here and uh, and Mark on my on my other side is kind of, you know, the the young adults in the room, I guess. So, uh, you know, th we're a 32 years young company, uh, nationwide. We've been the leader in kind of growing the organic fresh herbs in the in the market. And our legacy has been one of, kind of just like Paul alluded to, we started in the field. We're still majority in the field today, but over half of the last 32 years has been steadily moving into controlled ag. And so uh, controlled ag for us started out as, you know, low-tech greenhouses, right? Hydroponic low-tech greenhouses. After that, we decided to make a stand on certified organic, and we made a stand on, on working with soil. So. Our unique kind of approach, you know, to a soil-first, kind of biology-first, tech-enabled um, system 
um, started with our high-tech greenhouses. And so in that high-tech greenhouse environment, we learned how to produce our own nitrogen, right, in a liquid uptake form that's a closed-loop system. We also learned how that can interact with soil to ultimately produce super high-quality plants at a, at a great yield. And so, you know, again, over the last years, the frustration as a field farmer is just like all of us live every day, right? You never have the same consistency. You never have the same quality. You're trucking, you know, thousands of miles around the country to, to bring product and, you know, to, to get to your customers every day. And so for us, it was both an opportunity to leverage what we're doing on our science side and our organic growing side, but also to kind of solve for the challenges of freshness and flavor. And so solving for those challenges of freshness and flavor has led us to continue to evolve. And so more recently, we're actually evolving. We went to a hybrid model, which I guess you refer to as the black box, but a you know, full warehouse for kind of our early stage of growth, our nursery production. And then after that, we've now finally decided to move into full kind of vertical farming. And we will continue to do it with soil. Um, it will you know, be kind of very similar to what we've learned in the high-tech greenhouse environment, which is a very much a manufacturing approach. Um, so we take a very pragmatic approach, and I, I guess the litmus test for us, Walter, is, you know, one, does it guarantee the, the freshness promise, the improved freshness promise? Um, two, does it guarantee the improvement in flavor that we're all looking for? And three, I guess, is, you know, equally important for all of us who've been in the business is, can it make money? And I think those, those are pretty important factors to consider when, when moving. So, yeah, finally wrap it up today. We're, you know, about 80-20. So 80 is still um, field grown. And over the next, by 2023, made a commitment to basically move 90% of all our supply indoor. So we'll be one of the first in the category here to make a, a full shift. That's great. Well, as we're going to talk about in the second session today, I can tell you that, the, sorry, thank you, the, the customer right now is very confused. Uh, as to all these various choices and the, and the label claims. And so, you know, I, I've been a grocer 40 years. I've seen that. Uh, and you're going to see a slide in the second session that shows you just the types of choices are out in the marketplace. And all these gentlemen here are, are part of that uh, mess that's out there that customers are trying to sort through. But what's clear is the growth is real and uh, the growth is happening. And so I'd like each, to ask each of you to dive a little bit into your specific innovation that you are doing and pursuing, particularly with respect to resource use compared to outdoor agriculture, benefits, concerns, just so that they can have, the audience can have a, a bit more of a feel for why this is such a promising sector of agriculture. So whether it's energy, whether it's water, whether it's pesticide use, uh, whether it's any sort of resource use. So, uh, so Mark, would you mind diving into that question a little bit a bit you know, for the organic consumer in particular? Um, you know, what do you think, what, what is your particular set of innovations? Why do they matter? How do you see them playing out over the next number of years? Yeah, this is, uh, what's exciting is, I mean, this is something, when we talk about our history, we've been at this since 2004. So we've been really following the trends and seeing Again, where now the consumer is recognizing, you know, you mentioned the pandemic, uh, there's a better appreciation about how our food system is more challenged than ever before. And we need better appreciation for what? How challenging, uh, how challenged our food system is than ever before, right? So we talk about that food resiliency, but we also talk about climate change. Uh, we talk about worker welfare. We talk about, you know, concerns on pesticide use. Uh, these things are becoming more and more acute. And so, uh, what we've seen is the consumer leaning in and embracing technology, and this is what is exciting for us to think about how we are now leading with the fact is we're vertical farming, right? Where before the consumer wasn't even aware what does that mean. Just to be clear, what is vertical farming? So, so the idea, when we talk about vertical farming, we're growing indoors in warehouses, and it's vertical beds stacked on top of each other. No sunlight. No sunlight and actually no soil as of right now in terms of what we're doing. Um, but the idea that we're trying to deliver, again, for the consumer, so th there's a lot of things we're trying to do in terms of the end benefit for the consumer. Again, uh, Phil mentioned better flavor, better varieties, better freshness. Uh, those are the things that we talk about how to engage, how to create long-term customer loyalty. You make it taste good, right? Then we're doing things with this controlled growing, though. We're actually able to enhance the nutritional density. So we're able to stress the plants in very specific ways so that we can actually get greater vitamin C, greater vitamin E, uh, and things that the consumer is looking for. So this idea, in the, changing the value proposition, the flavor, the local, the nutrition, and really be able to uh, think about that consumer. Technology is enabling that. But we, what we've seen firsthand is the consumer is looking for, like, why are you different? What is, makes this different? And so 
Uh, we now actually have vertical farming. Uh, we actually have trademark vertical farming elevated flavor, the idea of this marriage of the control and that ability. Uh, we're doing something called flavor spectrum to, again, excite and create excitement in the category. You know, salads, and particularly leafy greens, historically, there's a, you know, the reason why salad dressing is such a big category is that greens don't and have historically have not tasted very good. People are enjoying, we're creating new eating occasions, snacking. People are just eating the greens right out of the tray because of how good they taste. So this has been exciting for us to see that consumer and how they're embracing that. So, but, uh, but come back, that's, that's a good, that's a good, but let's go back into your, your resource innovations, water, energy, light. How are you doing things differently than outdoors? Yeah, so fundamentally, just when we talk about this way of growing, so when we talk about that water usage, it's using through aeroponics. The aero and aero farms refers to a form of hydroponics, but we're misting the roots. So actually nothing ever touches the plant. And this is exciting for us because the plant is actually clean and ready to eat, offering tremendous amount of convenience to the consumer, but also we know that washing is very aggressive in terms of, again, either washing away the soil, washing away the chemicals, or washing away those micro-contaminants. So this way of controlled growing allows us to have that key benefit you know, for the consumer there. That water message is so critical when they see 95% less water. I mean, look, this is headline news in terms of, again, droughts and, and the things that we're facing. Uh, or too much water, and the idea that on the East Coast now there's too much rain, and so it's creating major issues. Uh, so this has become much more top of mind for the consumer. Then we talk about, again, the idea of zero pesticides. This is really important, zero. Not just organic, but zero, because this is important because the consumer, at the end of the day, wants that reassurance of a clean product. And so this is an opportunity to be able to reinforce that from that standpoint. And then because this is a precise way of growing, not only are we using less water, we're also using less nutrient. With that misting of the roots, we're actually looking at the droplet and the size of that droplet and how, thinking about how the plant absorbs nutrition and water to be able to optimize the plant at different stages of growth, different varieties, and then again, thinking about how to create what we call a growing algorithm. So this is very much, when we talk about embracing technology, this is very much codified into a formal process. You know, you talked about manufacturing, Phil. Yeah, this is this idea of just-in-time growing, very efficient, very focused, and very uh, judicious with those resources. Mm -hmm. And I'll mention the lighting just for one second because, again, uh, that's one of the things when people look about, uh, think about indoor farming, there's kind of a, uh, a focus on the lights. Well, we actually, our chief technology officer is formerly of a CTO of a, of a publicly traded LED company, formerly of GE Lighting. So when we talk about building our own lighting array, uh, we think we're easily about 24 months still ahead of the industry, both in efficiency and cost. And that's really critical. So where we are in terms of a you know, critical juncture, you know, we're able to grow uh, and have the right economics to be able to get the right kind of uh, profit return, to be able to expand our farms, and then to deliver the consumer a great value proposition. That's great. Thank you, Mark. So, Paul, over to you and sort of the same idea in terms of when you think about your innovations uh, indoors versus outdoors, explain or share with folks how, you know, where, where you are on resource use, how you're doing things differently indoors versus outdoors, and what the benefits are there. Yeah, well, the main part, again, is going back to water. So we've been recycling our water now for well over 20 years. Um, and I think the benefit, not only recycling the water compared to what we're doing in field farming, is we're not putting any water chemicals into the soil, which end up river streams, cause algae blooms, right? So I think that's another big plus when it comes to CEA and controlling all your water and everything you're doing. Um, I, I'm going to kind of say the same thing as them. To me, it's all about the product, right? So we're going to focus on innovation on varieties and flavor. Um, I've seen a lot of articles where people would argue that something tastes better grown this way or something tastes better grown this way. I disagree with that. I think the variety matters. And then however you grow it, then you're going to take away from that flavor. So your ultimate potential is always going to be in the genetics itself. And so that's something that we've been working on for over 30 years. You know, we brought Campari to the world, you know, the very first branded tomato because we knew we had to brand it because it tasted different. It set a big example out there. And um, so innovation for us is definitely going to be on uh, varietal research. Um, that being said, like I said, we've adopted a lot of technologies over the years. We've used a lot of lighting, uh, originally uh, HPS, high pressure sodium, gone into LEDs as well into the greenhouse. Um, we've even had our own black box that we've been working on for about 10 years. Um, and overall, I still think that something's missing on the LEDs still with, you know, something that I call it the magic sparkle still comes from the sun. And so using the both within the greenhouse, we believe we still are getting the best taste out of the varieties that we're doing right now. Um, we call it black box. We don't call it vertical farm. That's a term that we use within our own company because we view a greenhouse as being the original vertical farm when we're growing our vine crops. We're using the cubic space. So, you know, on that definition, that's something that we just say, you know, yeah, we call it black box. We've been doing vertical farm for 70 years. That's probably why Phil's sitting between the two of you because you, you guys have a different view on that. Right? But uh, you didn't... 
You want to speak about, you, I want to just have you comment on energy, energy use, because I do think that is also water, certainly, but energy use, how do you think about that versus outdoors? The, you called it the sun, the magic sparkle. I yeah, like that. so we're, we're yeah. still using the sun, right? And so, um, mm -hmm. you know, that's free energy right there instead of using just all uh, artificial right. lamps. And um, some of our greenhouses now, we've connected one of our greenhouses to a fertilizer plant. We're taking the waste heat and the CO2 from it. So we're looking at sources that aren't going to go away, that they're just destroying energy. So we said, why don't we, why don't we figure out how to make like, maybe a carbon neutral greenhouse and uh, use that energy? So we're using stuff like that. Let's go. So the black box is not, the black box is what you call the grow, the grow house? Yeah, black box is what we're saying is taking the warehouse and putting the lights inside and stacking it. Yeah. It sounds kind of like something else might be going on in there, but yeah. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> well, yeah, we'll leave it there for now. Uh, Phil, so same question really around your specific innovations and uh, you know how you think about those in organic and versus outdoor ag, et cetera. Yeah, so um, you know, first on kind of resource use. So, I mean, we use you know a resource framework that's that's typical, and I, and I will say, I think we all have to be honest as an industry. I mean, we hear a lot of measurements flying around and a lot of metrics flying around, and I think collectively, I think we've all got a better job in terms of measuring and actually quantifying, you know, what what the actual impacts are. I think directionally, we're all in, in full agreement. So, yeah, like uh, like Mark and, and and Paul here, it starts with water, right? I mean, I think that's kind of the the low hanging fruit and you know we also recycle our water we also have a closed loop system and um, our particular innovation on water is uh, because we use soil we're able to do very intermittent watering we keep our soil at kind of the right moisture level and so that enables us to you know compared to you know when we were hydroponic or compared to even when we were an outdoor greenhouse really water very very little um, for the crop so the roots kind of fight it out to get that water and to get that nutrient and so that that's helped us to further take down um, water use carbon I mean I think you know that that one you know kind of cuts both ways right I think we're all really committed here and, and the solve here is to you know, shorten the, um, shorten the miles to the ultimate consumer, right? And so I think taking airplanes and taking trucks, you know, out of the system, I think that's, you know, going to be good for, for everybody, for people and planet. And then when he goes to, to the lighting innovation, you know, I think on, on lighting, it's a very fine line that you walk between optimizing for what the plant can do and over, you know, dosing on lighting. So how, how do you come up with, you know, the right formula on, on LED lighting? I think, Mark, you referred to it and you guys have been working hard on your own solution. And it's, you know, to give the, the maximum amount of micromoles, you're trying to simulate kind of that summer solstice moment for the plant at all times. But the plant, you know, can only take up a certain amount of energy. So, you know, using the right lighting at the right intensity that can continue to promote that photosynthesis and that growth, but not overdoing it because then you're just simply, you know, burning energy. And so I think that's an area that we all have a responsibility to work on solve. And, you know, Paul's absolutely right. The, the light is free. And so, you know, inside Shenandoah Growers, we have a kind of a saying that's, you know, the ultimate solution, you know, for capturing sunlight is to use it for energy, right? And so I think think, you know, as we all move to renewables and as we, you know, move to solar, converting the energy of the sun into what powers those lights is going to be a true solve on, on that front. And then, yeah, organic. I mean, you know, our organic system, that's this, you know, live biological system um, that, you know, has dirt, it has soil, it has beneficial insects running around. Um, that enables us to really hold off pests in a natural way, to not have to use all of those chemicals. And then, the, you know, the core sustainability feature of us is we produce our own liquid nitrogen. And so we do that in a very sustainable way, um, converting ammonia, basically breaking it down with bacteria and uh, ending up with liquid nitrate, right? And so when you, you know, can find another source, an alternate source, and pulling nitrogen out of the air is an expensive, you know, endeavor, but it's, it's really... A, it's not a very sustainable endeavor. And so finding a solution that can provide sustainable nitrogen for the plants, for us has really unlocked a great potential. So those are kind of the core innovations that we're doing on our growing. So I think for all of you taken away from listening to the three of them, you can hear the wide range of uh, innovation and also kind of the benefits from indoor agriculture as they've spelled it out. And particularly around resource use, uh, water, energy, so forth, but also the innovation. And, um, and so I think you're, you're starting to see the reasons why uh, this is going to play an increasing play in the in, in supply chain uh, for the future. If we think about a planet that's going to 10 billion people, right, there's more people to feed, 
And there's also these questions about where are we producing the food to supply these folks and uh, how does that continue to move in uh, the local and the uh, regional direction. In all my years as a grocer, I've never seen a trend uh, as big as organic as two things. One is uh, plant-based, and which is happening. I've never seen the consumer move in so quickly in the direction of, of incorporating more plants in their diet. And this is not the vegans and the vegetarians. This is just everybody. And the second one is their interest in local production and uh, having more information about where the food is grown. And one of the advantages of CEA, of course, is that it can, uh, it can, the facilities can be distributed and can uh, speak to that concern of the, of the customer around that. But, um, so listening to those, those things, I think I want to ask you, uh, let's, let's take it specifically to organic. I know from my experience when the standard went in place for organic in the year 2000, it really unlocked the market. So we had started in 1990 in California standard, but in federal standard was in place in 2000, then the rules were written. Um, the rules for organic, uh, the standards I think are still, there's a, a lot of differences between uh, CEA growing and the actual outdoor organic standard, whether it's the fact that uh, um, you know, the hydroponics is, is, a, is an area of controversy, right, because they were, the USDA was sued, some of you may know, for uh, allowing uh, hydroponics to be an organic product. Um, the, the court ruled that the USDA had the authority. It didn't rule on the merits of that. So we still have that question outstanding as to whether that's cool or not. In Europe, the standards require organic seed. That's not true in the United States. So the question to really you is, how do, the, how do you see the organic standards evolving with respect to CEA? Do you see the need for a stronger uh, CEA standard, if you will, within the organic standards uh, over the next three to five years to, to, to support and facilitate the growth of CEA. So, Paul, why don't you go first? You go, Mark. Yeah, so we've been growing organics now for about 15 years uh, in the greenhouse. Originally, we started off growing in different media, so we were in rock wool and some other things that were allowed, and then uh, we switched over into containerized soil. So we've been in containerized soil now for about 10 years. Um, when it comes to the standards, I think there needs to be a specific standard, not only just in the U.S., but in Canada and Mexico, because right now there's multiple standards. And, and Canada actually has a higher standard than the U.S. And so um, it's a disadvantage sometimes because the U.S. allows imports to come in at different standards. And in Canada, we can't even grow specifically for a market. And so in Canada, we have to grow under the organic regime in the Canadian system of CFIA. And then, luckily, that's allowed to be in, in the U.S., but it doesn't allow us to be competitive to other markets if it's Mexico or Holland flying something in. And so on the standard, there definitely needs to be almost like a worldwide standard, I'd say. Great. Go ahead, Mark. Yeah. <clears throat> we would advocate, just like we saw for food safety, you know, what happened with the GFSI, Global Food Safety Initiative, to help, you know, harmonize the different standards out there is, I think, going to be really important. The fact that there is inconsistency from market makes it much more consuming, uh, much more difficult for the consumer at the end, and we're not doing them justice uh, in that part. Uh, we like to think about it, though, and we recognize that you know we think about the original um, work that was done. Uh, does it really reflect, though, today in terms of the, some of the realities, in terms of the growing, and some of the technology? You know, what just wasn't envisioned. Um, and so, for us, as a as a grower, as a producer, as a company, we actually went for something else. We went for what's called certified B corporation which factors in environmental uh, as well as societal factors. The idea that we're creating uh, year-round jobs, fair wages, uh, economic benefits, uh, is a different focus in terms of thinking again more holistically about, again, how to be good stewards. We think about all the stakeholders, not just the environment, but the community. And I think that's really what you're seeing now in terms of even the organic is appreciating those externalities. Uh, we see some of the developments happening with regenerative uh, organic. And that's, again, acknowledging that those externalities in terms of water usage or inputs had it been factored in and need to be factored in in terms of thinking about where we need to go as an industry, as a standard, but just more importantly because of the resource constraints that we're going to have. So a lot of work to be done, but we think that well, ultimately we're going to see a new level of standard, uh, standards that are going to be able to celebrate uh, the ability to do more with less. Do you, do you think there will be a separate standard for CEA within the organic standards? Yeah, we, we definitely think that there will be that opportunity because, again, there's differences. And so, again, what we want to do is take that consumer on the journey, uh, appreciate that there's different parts that are going to be meaningful. Uh, but at the end, I think that we all share a, a similar common spirit, which is, again, how to be good stewards. Right. Great. Thank you. Phil? <clears throat> yeah. Um, you know, so, so first of all, I think, you know, n number one, 
folks that are growing in whatever format they're, they're growing in and, you know, sticking to a, the purest method of growing and the cleanest method of growing, you know, I take my hats off to everybody. I think, you know, that's at the core of everything. When it comes to the, the certification, I, you know, I, I agree with Paul. I, you know, I think it's very difficult to have disparate standards. I think, you know, one of the things that, you know, about the, the USDA, you know, certified organic standard is there's a level of trust that I think has been built, you know, over many, many years with the consumer, where it's a, a guarantee that there's a, a level of rigor, there's a, a level of, you know, methodical nature and checking off that every single element that's going into a product is going to be certified organic. And so I, I think it's important to, you know, that we adhere to that standard. I, I you know, it is very frustrating. I, I agree with you. Uh, if you think about Europe, those standards are, are different to Canada and Canada's standards to the U.S. So, so I completely agree. I think moving to a global standard on organic that adheres to the same, you know, kind of set of consumer guarantees will be what kind of continues to provide certified organic the uh, momentum that it needs in the market as kind of a guarantee something a consumer can take a quick glance at and ultimately understand no it's you know not going to be gmo and it's going to be free of, of all the bad stuff and so yeah i think simply trust and maintaining that trust with the shopper um and then that we you know all have a standard it's it's not easy there's a lot of work to be certified organic um, but again, you know, not excluding other great methods of growing, but our view is, is very similar to Paul's on that. I just make an editorial comment here. Someone who was around to help, you know, make put those standards in place is uh, one is it, it really was the putting the seal in place that unlocked the organic market just took off after that after those ground rules were put in place. And so I think, you know, there's a lot of claims out there which which get confusing for the customer. And I think getting a standard out there even if it's one that you helped to create. Uh, in the last four years of the Trump presidency, the organic standards process pretty much just went to sleep. Uh, I know this new administration and Secretary Vilsack intend to invest in the standards and get that process rolling again. I really think that this is an important thing for the community to do in terms of getting uh, the, those standards out there so everyone, the customer, knows what they're getting. Um, and there's a, there's a baseline there. I think that's important. So. But let's let's talk about um, the different things, uh, some of the issues out there that have been that have really surfaced. Food safety is one. Let's talk about food access. Let's talk about uh, varieties, Paul. Something you mentioned to me. Part of the the growth journey here for CEA is going to be moving from the one percent to whether it's ten or whether it's fifteen. And you haven't given your prediction yet, Mark. But it's going to be: Can this system really, truly, uh, can it be safe? Uh, can it provide greater access to fresh produce? Uh, can it be, you know, these sorts of questions that are, that are out there? And is it actually healthier than food grown outdoors? So I'd like each of you to weigh in on this question. Can you deal with food safety? Will it be uh, better for food access? And is it, in fact, healthier for individuals and the environment? Mark, why don't you go first? Just a little question there for you. Yeah, how much time? Um, but really, when we talked about the founding of the CEA Food Safety Coalition, was at the heart of that was really thinking about making sure there was a couple key goals that we had with that. One was educating FDA. So for the last two years, I've been on the FDA Remain Advisory Task Force, seeing firsthand the issues and challenges with some of the recalls that are happening. And part of it's growing, part of it's on the processing side. Um, but those are becoming more and more challenging. And then you have the transition in terms of growing environments. So the idea of growing indoors, we can help mitigate some of those things that you traditionally see. So is it the, the full you know, blanket, full safe, uh, fail safe? It's not, but it's going to be uh, a way to help minimize some of the things that you're traditionally seeing in the field. So it's important. And the other part of what we wanted to do is that there have been a lot of new entrants into this indoor growing. We wanted to make sure we had the playbook. Uh, again, coming together as an industry, we wanted to make sure none of us can afford a recall. And the idea that, again, we're trying to share best practices and be able to make sure everyone is armed with the right kind of information so that, again, at the end of the day, thinking about that consumer. So that's a little bit on the food safety, but I think we definitely have uh, a different approach with the controls. Um, access. access. So this is important, right? Uh, the idea of what we want to... What we want to do is really this idea of democratize access to great tasting fresh food, right? So we actually have a farm stand where the community can come in and get access to freshly harvested produce. Um, as a company, we've taken a little bit of a different approach. Not only do we have our large scale commercial farms, we have our community farms. Uh, we're doing an initiative with the World Economic Forum and their Healthy Cities and Communities Initiative. It's a global initiative. We started <clears throat> with Jersey City. We're actually putting small distributed farms into the community, into municipal buildings, into senior assisted living, into schools, 
creating incredible connections with the food that they're growing. And it's given out through a grant to free to the community. So it's by the community, for the community. And we're continuing to invest in more programs like this to think about, again, how do we increase access? Uh, the fundamental aspect, though, in terms of our enabling that local production, providing the greens, and growing it, uh, you know, we're providing these jobs. People are getting you know, tremendous access to fresh, healthy food. So uh, that's an important differentiating uh, component there. Yeah, we can, but it's also what we want to do is change the value proposition, right? So what we think about is, again, better flavors, better varieties, better freshness, and then also better nutrition density. At the end of the day, you know, for packaged salads in general, 50% is thrown out due to shrink and due to waste. Um, how do we change that? We talk about energy, right? Think about all the embedded energy that's gone into that product, whether it's grown in the field or, or elsewhere. Our indoor growing, we can help minimize, improve that, and the consumer's actually enjoying it and we're seeing much different levels of consumption. So again, those are ways that we can change that value proposition dramatically. Okay, let's chat over to Paul, please. So Paul, really the question again is around uh, access, safety, and, uh, and is it actually helping for the customer? Yeah, so when it comes to safety, obviously in CEA, most of the facilities are completely closed, so we're blocking it out not only from the elements, but also animals, ground animals, all that type of thing. Um, in the greenhouse, we really don't grow on, on the ground anymore. Uh, the plants are actually suspended from the greenhouse frame, so nothing's touching the ground. Um, so when it comes to safety, you know, it's the highest level you can possibly find, I think, whether it's a greenhouse or you're going into a black box type of scenario. There's always going to be a human element, but that's probably going to change in the future too. The, one of the biggest problems we all have in the entire industry is people. And people just don't want to do harvest work anymore. They don't want to do crop work anymore. Uh, we've been working with robots now for about five years, and I keep on saying the future's robot. There's no question about it uh, when it comes um, on accessibility, that's going to help as well too, because you look at the technologies that we're deploying, um, not only on the robots, but also on the AI growing and all that. Eventually, there'll be high-level jobs in the greenhouse or in the black box, and then there won't be any manual type of labor anymore. The robots, our goal is to drop seeds in at one end, and it comes out packaged or you know, boxed on the other end when it's all said and done. So again, you're going to eliminate that human factor that might be causing the food safety issue right there. Um, and when it comes to parity, you know, when we started 70 years ago with the first greenhouse, we were twice the price of a field tomato. Today, and if we were growing what I call a utility tomato, which we don't, we go more towards flavor, but we can actually hit parity on a utility tomato against the field. That's not a problem at all. Yeah, and then the other question was really around, is it better for you? I think it goes to varietals. It talks about, you know, when you're looking at varietals for vitamin A, vitamin C, all these other type of phytonutrients. Again, I'm going to go back to the varietal point. When you're in CEA, you're not using chemicals. So yeah, it's better for you right there because you're not spraying the crop. Great, Phil? Yeah, um, so on the food safety point, you know, I, I think as Paul said, you know, the minute you start to take away some of those intrusion elements that you have in the field and the, the lack of control of what you can prevent out there, it certainly, you know, really ups the game on, on what the food safety looks like. I, I do completely agree, and, you know, having lived it, you know, um, for the last 30 years, that, you know, what really comes across is the human element. I mean, I think you're right, right? So, you know, what is a localizing production much closer to the population, much closer to the distribution? distribution center do, it reduces handling, you know, so whether you're harvesting at a farm and then taking it on a truck and then unloading it at a pack house and then shipping it across the country, it's all of those multiple touch points that really give you the biggest exposure to contamination. And so the fact that you can eliminate that, I think, is, you know, just huge for us collectively uh, as an industry. Um, in terms of access, Walter, yeah. um, you know, I, I think access comes down to, yeah, you can localize yourself close to food deserts. You can be in the south side of Chicago. There's wonderful opportunities to create, you know, the, the future of ag there. I think the promise of access is tied to what you can deliver on price and cost. And so I think if we're not able to get the economics right, the economics and the shelf right, that, you know, not just a niche customer, but a mainstream customer and those folks actually who live and work in those areas where building these farms can afford the produce, um, I think that that promise of access will, will be difficult. Right. I, would say, I think the main thing there is that, that, that at present indoor ag products typically look, uh, of course, you have a wider range, Paul, but uh, the greens and they're typically at a higher price point. And so uh, that accessibility issue is very much as we think about uh, the, the disparities that have shown up during COVID and just the need for people to eat more fresh 
fresh fruits and vegetables. So we're down to three or four minutes left in our session, and I want to go back to each of you and ask you. So the title of our session was, uh, you know, CEA or indoor ag black boxes. Of now we've got a black boxes. Got to talk about those two. Uh, reality or hype? I think, you know, Matt's view at, at the top was that this is going to be a growing part of the organic produce industry going forward. We know organics are growing double digit. We know the customer wants it. We know that. Um, so is it reality? Is it hype? Is it somewhere in between? Uh, Mark? Yeah, this is uh, what's exciting for us that, you know, this is very much about the reality in terms of, again, what we're doing and being able to deliver today not the future, today, a commercial farm that is able to derive the right economics and deliver the right uh, value proposition for the consumer. And that's one of the reasons. You're going back to the initial thesis. You're talking about the level of investment that's gone in. Well, it's because now we have history. We have track record. We can show uh, the operating history. We can show the response. We can show the sales you know, velocity that we're seeing with the consumer, with your audience in terms of the retailers. So uh, you have these proof points that this is an exciting uh, opportunity and this exciting stage that we're at right now. And on a scale of 1 to 10, how excited are you? Uh, it's a 20, right? So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think I think it's a you know clear reality. I mean, I think there's a ton of excitement. You know, Mark, what what, what is your level? 100? I'll go 200 on you. Um, you know, as you guys know, I'm I'm pretty pumped up about it. I think it's great. I think you know it's not a solution to everything, right? And I don't think you know we should all think about it like that. I think there's going to be a place forever, you know, in the field. And I think there's going to be a place forever in greenhouse, and I think there'll be a place in the future forever for what we now have been calling the black box, which you know uh, is is really the vertical in. Indoor. And so, um, yeah, I think, you know, what is important that it doesn't turn from reality to just hype is that we're able to maintain a promise, a promise to, you know, the shopper, a promise to our retail partners. Uh, and that promise is the promise of better freshness and better flavor. And at the end of the day, if we can't uphold that promise, then it could quickly turn into hype. And so I think that's all of our collective responsibility as we continue to engage. Yeah, and I think uh, definitely reality. You know, I think our company's proof of it over 70 years. We're, you know, we were in CEA 70 years ago. All we're looking at now is just adopting newer and newer technologies into that CEA space. So, right. um, you know, we're a profitable company. Um, you know, we're not a startup in any way. So I think that proof is in the pudding. Yep. So the pudding, okay. What will be the biggest innovation you do over the next three years to make it a reality, more of a reality? I think the biggest innovation is going to be actually getting the robots into the greenhouse and using AI to grow the crops. Bill, biggest innovation for you? Yeah, I think it's taking our you know approach, biology first approach, and soil first approach, and being able to execute it on a national platform basis and build these indoor farms, uh, and realize the uh, the you know what we believe can be cost parity with field, and so that's uh, where we're going. Yeah, it, it's really dependent on the category, but we see already tomato, it's the majority. So uh, it's going to be category specific. And then even as Phil mentioned, there's going to be multiple um, approaches that are going to be important in terms of, again, how do we service the community at, at large. Uh, but we definitely think that key categories that we're competing in, leafy greens, it could be berries, this is going to be, uh, without question, the majority. And our, our, our rate of prediction is much more aggressive than what you're predicting. Um, but we're eternal optimists here. But why? Because of technology. And so we talk about you know, what's going to be happening within three years in our farms. They're already smart, connected farms. But we just announced a major partnership we're doing with Nokia Bell Labs. This idea that we're taking technology and working with industry players outside of the traditional ag space and reimagining. We're doing things with drones and imaging. We're imaging and have the ability to image every single plant every single day. We talk about how to think about the quality, the health, and then more importantly, how to course correct. These are things that are really challenging to do out in the field. So this idea that this is going to just continue to improve our economics, the, the flow through. You know, if we were talking, you know, just two years ago, our crop cycles were 18 days, then it was 16 days, and now we're down to 14 days. That's significant progress, just in terms of crop turns and crop cycles. Then we talk about yield improvements. Uh, we're talking about significant yields that we're getting per square foot as well. So these are exciting things that are proving out, again, what we're doing today, but exciting in terms of that runway. Pause to our... Thank you.